right. It's good to be back. Hey, I love the new hymnals, all right? Um, part of the process of getting older means you can't see as well as you once could. Amen. Right? Yeah. I've got these things now. They're called bifocals. All right? I've got a large print Bible, and I use a 16-point font on my iPad so I can see. And so I just appreciate the, the new uh, we, I can I feel like I can see it well. And uh, nothing wrong with the older ones, but I uh, really, really appreciate uh, what you guys have done. And uh, it's just always exciting uh, for, for that. I know that um, uh, they'll be used uh, here in a, in a great way. Uh, you know where we're at this evening? We're going to be back in Leviticus. The most exciting Old Testament book, Leviticus chapter number 23. We started out talking about Sunday night, the Passover, uh, liberation through the land. That was the title of the message. And, uh, and I'm just going to just give a brief review, uh, just, uh, just for the sake of context. And uh, I think around here we understand what the Passover is. Uh, we understand that it's, it was an innocent lamb that died, shed its blood for the freedom of people. And, uh, and, and, and as that death angel came, when he saw the blood, they passed, it passed over that household, and nobody died in that household. And, uh, and a nation was born, a nation that was given to nothing but slavery, was given to nothing but hard labor, uh, was given to nothing but overrule, and just oppression was all of a sudden given freedom a new identity, and eventually a new home. And, uh, and so we, we talked about salvation that night. Last night, we talked about two, we combined two uh, of the Feast of Leviticus 23, uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, the Passover represented Jesus dying on the cross. The, the, uh, the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread represented His burial, unleavened, without sin. Without sin, striped, pierced, as leavened bread is. And uh, we, we got to talk about that. And, and then we talked about the offering of first fruits, or the first fruits offering, which was the, at the end of the barley harvest, the first harvest of the year. And, uh, and, and that's where I get so excited. And I might get excited again tonight a little bit. Because uh, as, as on Passover, the Sanhedrin was out, and they were marking the fields uh, where the first offering of first fruits was going to be given. And as they were binding it with that red cord, Jesus was being bound and tried before Caiaphas and then before Pilate. And then he was scourged. And as he was being scourged, those, uh, uh, those offerings of the first fruit had already been cut and they were taken closer to the temple, and they were beaten as well to knock off the chaff that would exist on the barley harvest. You just see how everything that Jesus went through is foretold right here in the book of Leviticus chapter number 23, written at least 1,400, not seconds, not minutes, all right, not days, but 1,400 years before it actually happened. I doubt if something happened 14 seconds ago and we interviewed everybody, we'd all even give the same story, right? Because that's just the way we are. But here, God, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, uh, Moses wrote as he was moved by the Holy Spirit these words. And so as this barley harvest was uh, uh, corded up and then slashed, beaten, and, and all of that, Jesus is then in the grave. That barley set for just a little while. And then on the first Sabbath... After the, this offering was given, that barley was brought into the temple and offered as the offering of first fruit. And that's the day Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead. I'm telling you, right there's the gospel in the Old Testament. And we don't even need the New Testament necessarily uh, to be able to present the gospel. We should be able to take any place and find that redemption story found in Leviticus or in anywhere in the Old Testament. And so that's where we were at last night. Tonight, 
We're going to skip forward 50 days in the calendar year. And we're going to talk about the offering or the feast of weeks. Imagine with me a farmer who has diligently worked in his fields, nurturing the seeds planted months ago. You guys have a garden? Any gardeners here? You just plant it, right? And walk away, right? No, you care for it, right? You got to keep the cats and the gophers and the groundhogs. That's what I was looking for, groundhogs, not gophers. Groundhogs away from it, the rabbits and all the other little kids in the neighborhood. And you watch as your seed that you planted grows. And as the weather warms, all of a sudden you begin to see the fruits of your labor beginning to flourish. In this case, the wheat stalks grow tall and golden, waving gently in the summer breeze. Farmer knows that the time of harvest is near. It's a time not only to gather the bounty, but to remember and to give thanks. And ultimately, and this is just the way this works, the Feast of Weeks is all about an offering. Yikes. Nobody likes to be told about an offering. Because that's where we get, we, we, we get pinched a little bit. But this is not an offering that they have to give. This is an offering that they get to give. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. It's an offering that it's not given grudgingly. But it's given purposefully. And with joy and remembrance. And it's given by faith. Knowing that God will provide even more after what's given. In ancient Israel, in this passage right here, this season is marked by the Feast of Weeks, a joyous occasion celebrated 50 days after the Passover. It was a time of bringing the first fruits of the harvest, of the wheat harvest, to the Lord in an act of gratitude and trust. The people of Israel would offer two loaves of bread made from new grain along with other sacrifices to honor God's provision and to acknowledge that everything they have came from Him. And you realize that tonight? All that you have came from God? You say, well, hold on just a second. I've worked hard for what I've got. But who gave you the ability to do that? Yes. Yeah. Who gave you the ability to wake up this morning? Well, for me, it was my iPhone. Because I wasn't going to wake up this morning. I was tired last night. And, and the ability I had to wake up this morning was, was that, that stinking lady inside my phone telling me it's time to get out of bed. And, and all that we had to do, to, do, to do today. The point that I'm trying to make is everything that we have is God's anyway. Yes. That's right. And when He asks for us to give a little back to Him, in a celebration. Man, I've been some part of some offering, uh, offertory services in the past where it's not a celebration. It's a grudging thing. Now listen, I pay a mortgage, okay? Grudgingly. I don't give willingly. Okay? I like to wait to the very, not really the last minute because I don't want to hurt my credit, but you understand what I'm saying? I don't want them sorry rascals to have my money any more longer than they need it. All right? But I get to give. Yes. It's a whole different attitude. It's a whole different way of looking at things. And tonight, we're going to talk about this offering in the celebration, uh, in the feast of first fruits. And then we're going to see a parallel passage in the, the New Testament and, and it's something that, uh, that, that I, I'm just re I'm really excited about tonight. So, the Feast of Weeks was known in the New Testament, of course, as the Day of Pentecost. Okay? And so tonight we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit some. And uh, I know there's a lot of people who get kind of timid uh, when we start talking about the Holy Spirit. Uh, only because we've allowed, we've allowed ourselves to be intimidated by it. 
Because sometimes we just don't know what's, what the Bible says and what experience says. I mean, I've, I've talked to people who told me, if you don't speak in tongues, you are not saved. And I throw this right back at them and I say, show me. Show it to me. If that's true, then I'll do it. <coughs> and, and of course they can't show it to me. Because it's, it's not in, in, the, in the Scripture uh, that way. And, and so tonight we're going to talk about this whole uh, Feast of Weeks. And as we look at the, 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 the New Testament and the Holy Spirit coming on the day of Pentecost, we have to understand God doesn't just do things out of randomness. He's very calculated. Yes. And He calculated when He was going to send the Holy Spirit. It was not an accident that Jesus died on Passover, was put in a grave on the unleavened bread, was raised on first fruits. He stayed for 40 days teaching. He tells the disciples, stay in Jerusalem because not a, just a few more days, not many days hence, the, the power of the Holy Spirit will come and you'll be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost part of the earth. And then he ascends. And if you're the apostles, you've got to be thinking, huh? I mean, this was unprecedented. And they, they wait around till Pentecost. Pentecost is one of the three feasts that required all Jews to come back to Jerusalem. So God knew all of Israel would be back in Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit comes. Instead of being God with us, remember Christmas, Emmanuel, we sing that. You know, it means God with us. But now we have God in us. Amen. Oh, this is going to be a good message yes, tonight. Lord. It's going to be a good message Come tonight. On. And so we're, we're excited. So very excited about this. This Again, is celebrated 50 days after the barley sheaf was waved during the Feast of Unleavened Bread on the day of first fruits. 50 days after that is this time. It's a designated time of 50 days. It links together uh, the offering uh, to be closer to the uh, end of summer, middle of summer, uh, where the wheat harvest would be preceding the other harvest that's coming, which would be the olive and the grape harvest. And we'll talk about that tomorrow night. Uh, tomorrow night. And so, uh, the, the, now, before we get into the text, uh, as we've talked about, Pentecost, I'm sorry, Passover has a connection for the Old Testament. Passover, Jesus died on the cross. Unleavened bread, there's a, the fact that they had to only eat unleavened bread. And then, then you have the, the, the first fruits offering and, 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 and all of that. These were all tied to Old Testament events. The Pentecost, or the, the Feast of Weeks, is not necessarily tied to an Old Testament event. It's just, an, it's just an offering. It's just a celebration. It's just an offering of, thank you God for your goodness to us. And it wasn't brought with fists to, 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 to have to shove the, the, the goods that God has provided, but it was done with celebrations, and it was done with joy, anticipating that God would continue to bring in a great bounty. So let's look at Leviticus chapter 23, verse 15. Leviticus chapter 23, verse 15. And you shall count unto them from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering. And that literally means what it means. They would bring that barley sheaf in, and the priest would wave it. Now, if you read different commentaries, some say the, the, the priest would wave it back and forth this way. And some say he would wave it back and forth this way. It really doesn't matter. Okay? But it was waved. So that's why I didn't want you to be confused thinking, well, what's a wave offering? Um, you, know, you, you know, and so that's what that is. Seven Sabbaths shall be complete. All right, even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, you shall number 50 days. Peninda is the Greek word for 50, which is where we get the word Pentecost, or even pentagram. It's the number five, so peninda, peninda, 50 days, you shall offer a new meat offering unto to the Lord. And we'll, we'll read the rest of it as we 
kind of walk through this passage. And so, to understand the Feast of Weeks, again, counting seven Sabbaths plus one day from the offering of first fruits, we get to the day of Pentecost. And there's a new grain offering that marks the beginning of the wheat harvest. And again, we should be thankful when, when we have something... Think, think back with me for just a moment. How many of you remember your first job? Okay. I remember my first job. I cut grass. I cut grass at my grandparents' house. Five dollars. And I thought I was rolling. I mean, took me an hour, push mowed it, and they were, he was strict. And he got me a couple of other yards, and I remember I would do four yards in a day, and I'd make $20. And I'm telling you, as a 12-year-old kid, man, I thought I was, up until 12, I was labor, I was free labor. Then I got to start making a little bit of money. But I just remember having that money for the first time that was mine. And I real, you realize, I understand, it's really not yours. But you understand what I'm saying. And you get that and... And then I, I remember, you know, thinking, well, I've got to give back. And I was not a very good giver. Because I wanted that. That was something I was saving up for. All right? And I, was, I needed a new bicycle. Because how else was I going to drag the mower behind me? You know what I'm saying? I needed an easier bicycle to, that had more gears, not just the one gear. And uh, that go up and down the hills and stuff, dragging that thing so I could, so I could make more money. And I remember the first time I had to give, I was, I was not a very happy person. Because I felt like I had earned that. But I remember getting that money for the first time and thinking, wow, this is something. My blood, sweat, because I'd always bleed whenever I, would, whenever I would mow, cut grass. still do a lot of times. I don't know how it works, but I ride on a mower and I bleed. It's just terrible. But, uh, but anyway, as, as, uh, as the saying goes, that was my money and I was going to do with what I wanted to do. And then I was told, well, you're supposed to give. You're supposed to give 10%. And I was like, said who? Said who? I thought, what tax is this? And then I read, will a man rob the church? Is that what it said? Will a man rob Israel? Will a man rob, well, at that time it would have been Mr. Reagan? The president? No. Would a man rob God? I didn't want to be a man to rob God. And so, I'm not saying it was out of fear, but I wanted to be obedient. And so, I became a, instead of a grudging, it became something that I was willing to do. Yes, and that's what this offering's about. Having a willing heart. And there was, there was some prescription uh, for this. The Feast of Weeks, in the Hebrew is known as Shavuot, and it occurs 50 days after Passover, and it's a celebration of the wheat harvest. We got to go to Israel. I, my wife's been twice, and I got to go once. Brother Jerry planned the trip, and then he decided to go to heaven, and so uh, so I got to lead that, that trip. But when Brady was a young, uh, she was in high school, I guess, she got to go the first time. And I remember being in Israel, and... They taught us some of the celebrations they did. And I was really curious because I was thinking, you know, I was raised in a dignified Baptist church. No joke. And I'm not making fun of the church I came from. But if you said amen, everybody looked at you. If you laughed, people were like, what in the world is going on with that guy? I mean, it was just very dignified. All right? And um, anyway, we went to Israel. And it blew my mind because they were not quiet. Uh, they, they had a, a dance they did that was not sensual. Please understand, God is not the author of sensuality in worship, okay? That, that's going to be Satan, all right? But these people are happy. Jews are joyous people. Israel's a joyous place. And they had joy and fun around all that they did. And so when it says celebration, don't just skip over that. 
understand this. Well, it wasn't a party, but it was a celebration of, hey, look what God has done. And what will God do next? And I think sometimes in our churches, and, and even in our own spiritual life, it's been a long time since we've actually seen God do something amazing. And sometimes I think we just forget that God still can. And God still wants to. And we need, if we need to be ready to celebrate. Now, decently and in order. I get it. I'm not advocating us to start <coughs> swinging from the chandeliers. You've got to get chandeliers first. And then, I'm not advocating for that at all. But what I am saying is, it's okay to be happy. And it's okay to celebrate when God does something good. Yes. There was a huge party last night in Boston. <laughs> now my friend Vic Miller back here, he's from Massachusetts. Alright? But I don't know, you're, you're, not a, you're not a Celtics fan, are you? I didn't think so. He's not a basketball fan. He is a Red Sox fan, though. And they had a huge party in 2004. Didn't you? You broke the curse, right, against the Yankees. We're not talking about a celebration like that where it's a once in a lifetime. This is, hey, we're seeing God do something great and we're going to anticipate Him doing more. Yes. Yes. Amen. And so let's be excited. Let's be cheerful about, hey, I have the privilege of giving this and I'm, I can't wait to give more. And I know that sounds crazy, but that's God's economy. God wants us to live by faith. Because if it's not by faith, it's sin. If you're living because you figured it out, you're living in sin. Open sin, and I said it. Open sin. Because if you can figure it out, it's not by faith. But if you're waking up every day and you're just wondering, I'm not sure what God's going to do. He's going to have to do something great or, or this isn't going to work out. Man, that's exactly the way we ought to be living because that's the way Israel lived. And then when they got a harvest, whew, they had a party. They had a party. And so let's look at those offerings. Verse 17. You shall bring out of your habitation two wave loaves of different <coughs> deals. Okay? So, without going into a lot of, because I don't understand baking, if you gave me an easy bake oven and you gave me cookies that were already mixed up, I'm going to mess them up. Okay? Now give me a grill and raw meat and I'll get it good. Okay? But I'm not, I'm not all that great with, with the, these kinds of things. But there are two loaves that were going to be made and then literally waved either this way or this way in front of, uh, in the temple. They were going to be made with fine flour, baked with leaven. These are with leaven. Now last night we talked about unleavened bread and how most of the time leaven is a bad thing. But here we see God asking for a wave offering to be given that has leaven in it. It seems we call those apparent contradictions. They're not contradictions. They're apparent contradictions. And so we've got to dig deep and find out what in the world does God mean when there's, okay, there's some here that are not supposed to be made with leaven. Leaven is sin. The leaven of the, the scribes and the Pharisees and, and all of this. Well, the, the, unlike most offerings, which were unleavened, these loaves included leaven symbolizing the presence of sin in humanity's imperfection. God knows. He understands that no matter what, we're still sinners. We have that sin nature from Adam. And when you get saved, you don't lose that sin nature. You lose the consequences of it, and you have a helper in the Holy Spirit that indwells you but you don't lose that propensity to sin. We all still have it. Paul at the end of his life said, I wish I was closer. I wish I'd have attained already. But I've only, I've only come this far. And church, there's only... Again, it's not the intestinal fortitude of us just deciding we're not going to sin, Brother Jimmy. It's us being filled with the Holy Spirit of God and us dying to ourselves 
in us yielding and obeying what God wants from us out of His Scripture. And so, part of it, this is a puzzling part. I completely admit that this is a puzzling part of, of the thing, but these leaven never touch the altar. They never are burned on the altar. They, they never come close. It's almost as if, hey, remember, God, we are merely forgiven, and we still need your help. And we'll see how this all connects with the giving of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost where these wave offerings were made. The, the, the Holy Spirit, when He comes inside of us, he, he understands that we are still sinners. And the only reason He can come inside is because we have trusted Christ and then He comes inside of us and He's there to help us. But that sin nature is still, that old flesh is right there. We don't forget the things we did. Oh, how I wish I did. Oh, how I wish the moment I got saved I forgot everything. I wish the scars that we had went away, but they don't. That's not the way it works. The physical scars. But what happens is we have a new home in heaven. We're given a new name. We have a new song in our heart. There's a lot of new things. Paul says... That we're a new creature, a new creation in Christ Jesus, but we still have that same propensity to sin. It's what separates Jesus' humanity and the fact that he never sinned. Because even if he did a little bit, he would have been completely tainted and unworthy of dying for our sins. And so as we look at this, this wave offering, we see these two loaves. We'll look at with me in verse 18. And you shall offer the bread with the bread, seven lambs without blemish of the first year and one young bullock, two rams they'll be for a burnt offering unto the Lord with their meat offering and the drink offerings that are poured out, even an offering made by fire of sweet savor unto the Lord. And you shall sacrifice one kid of the goats for a sin offering and two lambs of the first year for a sacrifice of peace offerings. Sounds expensive, right? And, a, and the priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits for a wave offering before the Lord and the two lambs. They shall be holy to the Lord for the priest. And so you have a burnt offering, you have sin and peace offerings, you have a wave offering, you have a holy convocation, a sacred assembly where all the Israelites come in together and they worship and they remember and they rehearse over and over about what God has done in their life, how God took them out of Egypt, a place of bitter bondage, gave them a new place, gave them a new land, gave them a new name, and has made them a great nation, and they're all that they have is only because of the work that God has done in their lives. Does that sound familiar to you at all? Because you and I sit here, now listen, the church and the Israel, not the same thing. Not the same thing. This whole church, I don't need to talk to you right now. My phone was ringing, sorry. The church is completely different than Israel. Okay? Israel, right now, has been, the, the pause button has been pushed, and God will deal with them when the tribulation happens. Okay? And there's this church age, and that's why I believe these two loaves represent Jew and Gentile standing equally before God. The church is not a, this is not a Gentile church, and we have Jewish churches. Man, we seek to divide things up. But God wants to unify things. I think we've got to be careful on saying, well, we're going to be this kind of church, and we're going to, no, 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 no. This church, anybody that wants to walk through these doors ought to be welcome to come here. The gospel should be preached to them. We ought to be thankful when people come in and, and that. So you have this grain offering. You have these seven lambs that are sacrificed. A kid of the goats for a sin offering. Two extra lambs for a peace offering. There's a lot of blood. And some of these are kept alive and then given to the priest so that they can eat. It was one of the ways that God had to take care of the, the, the Levites and the, the priests there in the, inside the, 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 uh, the, the, the congregation of Israel. 
And so what is the, some, some spiritual significance of this feast? Well, when we look at first fruits, again, last night we talked about the first fruits offering is that of Jesus' uh, resurrection. All right, this one, we're acknowledging God's provision and blessing. And we're offering the first and the best portion of the harvest as a sign of gratitude. I think it's, that's an important piece that we don't need to overlook. God's not looking for spare time and spare change. And we like to work that we, we're Americans, we, we like to compartmentalize things. But God, God's not a compartmentalizer. He doesn't want 90% of you. He doesn't want 50% of you. He wants you. Yeah. That's what he wants. And he wants you to offer him willingly your heart. He wants you to offer him willingly your life. He wants, him to, he wants you to offer Him willingly everything that you have. It's like when our children were born. We, just, we gave them back to God. And we, we, had, a, we had a little ceremony. And, and we know Brandon and I could have just done that without anybody present. But, you know, we wanted people to, to be a witness to that. Where we dedicated them, as we see in the Old Testament, a dedication back to God. We didn't even want to keep our own children back for, for us. We wanted them to be given over to the Lord. And tonight, God, through this offering, I think the challenge is very simple. Does He have all of you? Does He have all of you? Or does He just have you Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night? Or Sunday morning and Wednesday night? Or Sunday morning? Or every other Sunday morning? Okay, let's take church attendance out of it. Does he have all of your time? How much time do you give him every day? How much time do you give to reading the Bible? And not just read it like you read the newspaper or that you're thumbing through or scrolling like we do now through Facebook to see whose birthday it is and everything else and everybody's gossip and what you had for lunch the other day and I'm not saying you, but you know the proverbial. Sometimes we approach the Bible that way. And God does not want that. He doesn't want to be second to anything in your life. And you know what? He doesn't deserve second place. He doesn't deserve third place. He deserves everything you have, and He deserves everything that you are. How much of you does God have? Oh, you may be younger tonight, and you've got your life completely planned out. Guess what I did too? I was going to study, but brother, brother Carl can figure out this. I was going to study at the University of Notre Dame. I was going to study law. And I was going to defend Christians in the courtroom. I knew God was calling me into ministry, but I didn't want to be poor. Can I just be honest? I just I didn't want to be broke. And I didn't want to... I didn't want to have to do a lot of things that preachers have to do. And it came at a night at church camp where the pastor literally just asked, does God have you or does he have just a piece of you? And I realized right then, I was only giving God a very little part. And I thought I was doing my job. That night, I thought I was doing God a favor. And I walked down chest out, not broken at all. And I, and I, the youth uh, pastor was there and he was, he said, so why are you coming down? And I said, well, because I'm coming down to surrender my life. He said, well, praise God. Made me feel, it felt, it fed my narcissism, just going to be honest with you. I said, great. He said, what are you surrendering your life to? I said, I'm going to, I, I, literally I said this, I want to preach anywhere inside the state of Indiana that God sends me. <laughs> I was doing God a favor because nobody wants to go there. <laughs> right, Carl? <laughs> See, I can make fun of myself too for being a Hoosier. 
was a Hoosier by birth, but I guess I'm from, I'm, I live in Tennessee by choice now. <laughs> That's not surrender, church. God wants all of you. He doesn't want a little bit. He doesn't want you to piece yourself out to him. He wants you to come and like jump in the offering plate and say, God, I'll do whatever you want me to do. Now, you do that, that does not mean you're on your way to the mission field. It might. It might. But it doesn't mean what he wants is he just wants you. Just like if you're married tonight. You want your spouse to just devote your, themselves to you. God wants you to devote yourself to Him. Not a little bit. He wants you to share all of your passwords with Him. He wants you to share one bank account with Him. He wants to share everything with you. Your fears. Your dreams. Your plans. Everything. Does God have everything? And if he does, did you give it without celebration? Or did you give it hilariously? Hey, God, you can have it all! Willingly, cheerfully, lovingly. This offering was the best portion of the harvest. And it was done and given with gratitude. Go with me here now. Acts chapter 2. Here's the New Testament fulfillment. Of course, Acts chapter 2 highlights the fulfillment of this Feast of Pentecost, or Feast of Weeks, with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We are called... To seek the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. We're called to proclaim the gospel boldly. We're called to live in unity and generosity. Because every time you see in the book of Acts, God moving, you see generosity follow. You see it. And then Paul said, one of the final things Paul says is better to give than to receive. You see, I'm not picking on anybody tonight. Because this is just the next feast. And listen, I don't like necessarily talking about giving as much as I like hearing messages about giving too. I get it. But you know what? Bible's Bible. And this is revival messages. And sometimes we just need, we need a good, hard look in the mirror sometimes. And we need to ask ourselves, does God have all of me? Does He have it? And am I doing this out of obedience out of a cheerful heart, or am I, am I being forced to do it? We see the day of Pentecost, verse 1, chapter 2 of Acts. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, there was, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like, a, like as a fire, and it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Tongues is the Greek word for language. And they were dwelling at Jerusalem, Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven, and when it was noised abroad, the multitude came together, they were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. So that's like if my language was, my heart language was, well, if we had Brother Victor come up, his heart language is Yankee. Okay? <laughs> He's been down here a good little while now. But how many years? 13. 13 years, but it's still his heart language. And he gets up here and speaks, and you hear him in East Tennessee English. Okay? I know I'm being a little facetious. But it'd be like if my heart language was Greek, and I'm speaking Greek, but you're hearing me in English. That was tongues. And that was only made possible because the Holy Spirit of God 
was doing a work in everybody's heart. It was not something that we are to ascribe to. In fact, Paul later says this, is a, this was a lesser gift. This was not one to be ascribed to. That you wanted to try to, like you, would, you didn't want to be the one to speak in tongues. This is not what that is. This is a chance for the gospel to be preached to the masses. Right now, if you're following this, the European Championship, the Euro Cup is on ESP or Fox uh, every day. And if you look out into the stands when they're talking, sometimes there's people and they have these little things over their ears. It's because somebody is translating what's being said into their language. Before tongues, this is so we'd have to have a translator. But at the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was the translator. Amen. And he translated what was being said so that they could hear. And how many people got saved? 3,000 3, plus get saved. Amen. I mean, a total move of God. And it was not, hear this, this was not done. God just didn't say, you know what, day of Pentecost, that would be a great day to send the Spirit. He was connecting it once again back to the Feast of Weeks in Leviticus chapter number 23. And so today, the Holy Spirit, He indwells us. You want the Holy Spirit? Get saved. You got Him. He not only indwells us, He seals us. That's like stamping approval. He guides us. He teaches us. He empowers us to serve and to witness. He sanctifies us. He helps us grow spiritually. <clears throat> you ever been convicted of sin? That's the Holy Spirit. John 16, 8. When He comes, He'll reprove or judge the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. You ever been so broken over something that you can't pray? You just open your mouth to say something and nothing comes out? Holy Spirit's praying for you. He, he understands. He knows your heart. And He's, he's, he's interpreting. He's going to God on your behalf. The Holy Spirit's not some mystical force. He's the third member of the Trinity. And so many times in our churches, we ignore Him because we don't want to be like those over there that emphasize the Holy Spirit. And we do a disservice. And we just act like He doesn't exist. In churches, I'm standing here right now. He's just as much as the Trinity as the Father is and the Son. The Holy Spirit is not here, though, to speak on His behalf. Jesus says He will speak of me. The Holy Spirit is speaking about Jesus. The Holy Spirit is calling men and women all over this world to go into missions, to go into ministry. He's equipping them. He's empowering them. The Holy Spirit is still working and moving today. We have another applicant coming, going to the San Francisco to start churches. We were in Hawaii. I know it's a terrible place to have to go preach. But um, preach a missions conference in Hawaii, and they responded during the invitation on the first night, surrendered their life to go plant churches, saying the Holy Spirit has called me, just like He's called me, called them. And you know what? God may be calling you to do something tonight. It may not be to go out and start churches, but it may be to start a ministry here. Maybe to get more involved. It may be. The Holy Spirit speaking to you because He's only got a portion of you. And He doesn't have everything of you. It doesn't mean you're not saved. It just means you're not yielded. And can I, I mean, if I can be totally honest and true today, there's times I'm not completely yielded. There's things that the Holy Spirit's asked us to do that I've, I've literally said no. That wasn't right. But, but I have because it was going to be hard. Physically, spiritually, emotionally. But you've got to do it anyway. Holy Spirit is here to help us, to guide us, to comfort us, to empower us. And so let's not forsake or forget the Holy Spirit. So we see Passover, 
Jesus is salvation. Unleavened bread, he's in the grave. First fruits, he's resurrected. Fifty days later, Pentecost. Now, what's significant about Pentecost? Well, a lot of, some people see this as the start of the church. I put, I, I, anyway, I'm not going to get into where the church started, but I will say this. The church was empowered here. Instead of God with us, it was God in us. And if you go back to Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, Jesus says, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you'll be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to uttermost parts of the earth. This Feast of Weeks is the beginning of the harvest season. And that's where we're at right now. In our time, this, we are in the harvest season. And so church, let's get busy harvesting. Now, does that mean we carry around sickles and bags and freak everybody out? No. What it does mean is we need to be busy because we have no idea when that shofar is going to blow. And when that shofar blows, whoever is still here after the rapture, they don't, you don't want to be here after that. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about that tomorrow. We're going to talk. We're not predicting the future. We're not setting any dates. We're not saying if this happens, oh, no, Jesus could come back today. Yes. It's all ready for him. He could come back. But tomorrow night we're going to blow the shofar and, uh, and maybe we'll wake up some neighbors around here and, uh, and, and things. It's going to be an incredible, incredible night as we talk about, I talk about those, those things. And so tonight, I just want to leave this, this one challenge. And I've said it, and I'm just going to leave it here. Does God have all of you? Because that's what He wants. He doesn't want you to be perfect. Because you can't be. He doesn't want you to be good or talented. He created you. So you don't have to earn this. He just wants you. It's why we know God has a sense of humor. Because God created some of us. And some of us are just odd. And that's the way it is. But you know what? God can use anybody here. And not only does God, God can, He wants to. He wants to use you tonight. He's left us here during this harvest time. We have the greatest conveniences in all of the world. We can leave here, drive to Tri-Cities, and be anywhere in the world within 24 hours. We can be anywhere in the world right now on live stream. We have the tools. What we lack is laborers. This church will not continue. It will not grow if only five or six people are doing all the work, it's got to be everybody. God has a place for you in Gospel A Baptist Church or at East Side Baptist Church. God has a place for you in this global harvest. And so let's stop making, mis not mistakes, excuses, and let's just get over ourselves. And let's roll our sleeves up and let's go do some harvesting. Because people die without Christ, they go to a place called hell. Mm -hmm. It's a horrible, terrible, terrible place. We'll touch on that tomorrow night. We don't want them to get saved to just not go to hell. We want them to be saved because it glorifies the Lord. Mm -hmm. But we don't want people to go to hell. It ought to motivate us. Yes. But the greater motivation is, does God have you tonight? Let's pray. Every head bow, every eye closed. Get a song here in just a moment. Again, we're not going to stand and sing. But I, I'll just, I'm going to ask, because I, I just want to pray. I just, I, just feel, I just feel led to do this tonight. Would there be someone in here tonight that would say, Brother Adam, I have only given the Lord certain things 
but I've not given him everything. Would you please pray for me? If that's your heart tonight, nobody's looking around. I'll pray for you. I won't embarrass you. I won't come to you. I won't, won't even wink at you. But I will. I promise you this. I will pray for you. Anybody willing to admit, I am just not giving everything to God, and I want to. Will you please pray for me? Hands up right now and down. Hands all over the building. Lord, you've seen the hands. More importantly, you've seen the hearts. Maybe some that raised their hand or that didn't raise their hand that needed to. God, I pray that you will move in this time of invitation. That God, everyone that raised their hand or didn't, that needed to, would just whisper a prayer to you to say, God, I'm surrendering everything to you. Not a little bit, everything to you. And God, we're just going to give you the honor and the glory for it all. Because this is not about me or the church or the pastor or the ministry. This is, this is about you dealing with our hearts and us just surrendering to you. God, I pray that, you'll just, that we'll see a church of surrendered folks who are just ready to serve you wholeheartedly, holding nothing back, putting nothing in front of you. God will just give you the honor and the glory for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. As the pianist plays, please, you can pray in your seat. If you want to come down and pray here at the altar, we would invite you to come and pray here as well. But if you are already fully surrendered, I encourage you to pray. There were a lot of hands that went up. Pray for your fellow church members and your fellow believers that they would surrender their life and mean it. And that we would live a life of celebration and not one of that we have to live for God, but that we get to live for God. Not one of compulsion, but one of celebration. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back. or just surrendering to do anything. Now, God may not be calling you to the mission field. Maybe He's calling you just to get out of your comfort zone and be a church greeter. Say, brother, I'm an introvert. You want me to greet people at the church? Not me, but God. If God laid something on your heart, just surrender yourself fully to Him. Because there is no better place to be than in His perfect will. I'll close with this one thing and then we'll uh, end in a word of prayer. I, they say C.T. Stud, Stud said this. They say other people said it. I don't know, but it's a good quote. I won't end on it. On this. One life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. What are you and I doing for him? Does he have me entirely? Yeah. Or does he have me only in some moments? 
when I open up the day, it's the first thing I grab my phone or do I spend time with him? What are we doing for him? I hope and pray that this revival just ignites something in us. Let, let's close in a word of prayer here. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we come before you tonight, Lord, just to thank you, God, for the wonderful preaching we've heard the past few nights, especially tonight, Lord. God, I know it's spoken to my heart, and I'm sure, Lord, it's spoken to other hearts here tonight. God, I just pray that your will be done in, in the lives of everyone that's here and in the lives of those that are watching by way of Facebook. God, I just pray, Lord, that you, you'd soften our hearts, Lord, to your teaching and to your word. And especially, God, just the prodding of your Holy Spirit, God, guide us throughout this week. Bring us back here again safely tomorrow night, God, and just open our eyes and hearts, Lord, that we may grow closer to you, learn more about you, learn more about what you would have us to do in this life. And help us to take that next step by faith, God, to do whatever it is you're calling us to do. To do whatever it is you're laying on our hearts, God. These things we pray and ask in your Son's holy name. Amen. 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 Amen.